Hello, everyone, and welcome to What's in Your Lowy Steet Syndrome Family Tree Genetics, Variability, and Outcomes. I am Angela Christ. I am the director of the Lowy Steet Syndrome Foundation and the director of marketing for the Marfan Foundation. I want to also introduce to you Bruno, who will be our uh, backup moderator tonight. He will be chatting with you in the app, um, helping to provide different resources um, and helping welcome everyone to the group. Hello. We are Hi, Bruno. <laughs> we are now officially in, come on slides, there we go. In week two, of the International E3 Summit, Educating, Empowering, and Enriching Our Community, brought to you by the Marfan Foundation and its divisions, the Lois Dietz Syndrome Foundation and the VEDS Movement, and our partners in Europe at VESERN. We thank you. We are so grateful uh, for you for making this summer, summit this summit truly historic. It is by far the Marfan Foundation's largest events with nearly, actually more than 2,700, I should have updated the slide, 2,700 registrants from over 70 countries. And not only do you all come from around the world, but you also represent several different conditions, um, even within Louis Dietz syndrome. So, or even the different, um, variations within Lois Dietz syndrome. You can see there our group from Lois Dietz is the second biggest group in this summit. And we are so excited about that to have so many people coming together with Lois Dietz syndrome all in one place, you know, place air quotes, but it's wonderful. There's been great conversation and great sessions on Lois Dietz syndrome. Um, we're also thrilled that more than 300 medical professionals are joining us to hear from the leading joining us to hear from the leading experts on these conditions. We are deeply grateful to our presenting sponsors, Brigham and Women's Hospital and American Communication Construction. And before we get started, I want to let you all know that the International E3 Summit is a forum to provide an open discussion of issues related to genetic, aortic, and vascular conditions. Opinions stated in each of the talks are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of the Marfan Foundation or VESERN. If you hear differences of opinion from speakers and want further clarification, please contact our help center at marfan.org slash E3 ask. And we do request that you be patient um, as the volume of questions as you might imagine is very large, uh, but it is our top priority to get all of those answered as soon as we can um, and to the best of our ability. Before we move on to the presentations, I just want to remind you to that we are we very much value your feedback. And when this session is over or when you leave um, the session, we would very much love your feedback. So you can start right here in the app or on the website, wherever you're viewing, um, whether you're viewing this live or on record, recorded later on, um, you can see that there is an area right there that says rate. I click on that, go in, it's a, uh, this feedback form, it takes less than a minute. We made it very simple, but it is very powerful information for us in helping determine how we're going to um, uh, make sure we're getting the right information to the right people going forward, because we know this information and this education is critical in the lives of so many people. Uh, following this session, there will be plenty of time for questions. Please do put them in the Q&A section for the session in your app. So either whether you're online or on your phone, on an app, um, there is a Q&A section. Uh, please do put your questions in there instead of in the chat so that we're sure to see them all. Um, and we will do our best to get to as many of those questions as we can. Um, and with that, I think we're ready to turn it over to Dr. Hal Dietz and Gretchen McCarrick for what's in your Lois Dietz family tree genetics, variability, and outcomes. So I'm going to stop my screen share for just a second. And we're going to bring up 
our presenters. Hang on just a minute while I get you all switched over. And we're going to go to this. Okay. Um, Dr. Jeets or Gretchen, which one it, would you like to just introduce yourselves real quickly and um, I don't, whichever one of you wants to go first, you're welcome to do so. Go ahead, Gretchen. My name is Gretchen McCarrick. I'm a genetic counselor at Johns Hopkins. I've been with their connective tissue aortopathy group for about 19 years. Um, have the pleasure to work with the entire team at Hopkins. It's really an honor. Um, I've also am co-founder of the Lowy Steet Syndrome Foundation and new member of the professional advisory board of the Marfan Foundation. I'm so happy to be here tonight. Hi, I'm Hal Dietz. I'm a pediatric cardiologist and geneticist at Johns Hopkins, and I've really dedicated my clinical and research career to the care and study of people with connective tissue disorders that affect the cardiovascular system, um, prominently including Lowy's Dietz syndrome. And um, I'd also like to thank Gretchen for the privilege of working with her for so long. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> um, here we go. Great. Okay, so um, the topic tonight was pretty broad. So we had a chance to go through some of your questions and try to hit some of those topics in this kind of introductory talk. Um, but I do have some sharp pivots to try to hit the different information. So just um, go with us, I guess. So I think it's important just to build some really big context surrounding genetics. You know, we all have 20,000 pairs of genes in the human body, but in actuality, we only know what about a quarter of them do. So three quarters of our genetic information have not yet been associated with human disease. And then when we're thinking about um, connective tissue disorders or aortopathies, we're really um, filtering that down to only about 25 to 50 genes. So as of 2020, there's still a heck of a lot we need to learn about the genetic etiologies to um, aortic conditions and connective tissue disorders. When someone walks into our clinic and has an aortic aneurysm and we're sending out an aortopathy panel, um, we usually quote that there's about a 30% chance that we actually get a genetic diagnosis. And this is higher in individuals who present with um, uh, systemic syndromic features who have young aneurysms or have larger family histories. And this is just important to keep in context um, for people who might have had aerotopathy testing and it's negative. It's always important to stick with genetics every few years because more genes become available um, through genetic testing. Um, it's also important just to think about how many genes we have because our Lois Dietz gene doesn't operate um, in a vacuum all by itself. And we have all these other genes with variances that are gonna impact how someone presents in the clinic. So in addition to panel testing for aortopathy, some people get, come to a genetic diagnosis because they have a testing technology available these days called whole exome sequencing. So if you can imagine um, panel testing is like looking for gene changes in a single book that has to do with aortopathies. And whole exome sequencing is looking for those changes in the whole library. Um, so you're going to find many, many variants. But again, we don't know what a lot of those variants do as of 2020. And many people will say, great, we're sequencing all of my genes. Of course, you're going to find the answer. But again, in actuality, by even doing all of this sequencing, we only find an answer in about 30% of patients. Um, and in adults with kind of mild nonspecific connective tissue um, features, that percentage is actually um, lower. The good thing about whole exome sequencing, however, is that our DNA doesn't change over time. So if you've had this test, um, we can continue to go back to the data and look at the DNA um, changes as new genes are discovered over time. So whenever we do a genetic test, there can be three answers that we get. It could be clearly negative. So sometimes variants are found that are benign or likely benign, they're non-disease causing variants. Usually these are so common in the population, they're not even gonna be reported out on your test report. 
a result could be clearly positive, a pathogenic or likely pathogenic or likely disease causing variant. And this is typically a variant where the gene change in the gene truly causes the gene not to work. Maybe it's been reported in the literature in someone who has low East Eats syndrome. In this instance, we can use medical guidelines to help take care of you. We can clearly test family members and say who has disease or who does not have disease. And then sometimes when we do genetic testing, we can get an answer called a variant of uncertain significance. So this is a gene change where we're not 100% sure it truly causes disease. We're not 100% sure we can blow it off, that it's um, a non-disease causing variant. And a lot of low East Deeds variants kind of live in this center section. We're pretty good at interpreting VUSs and say it's likely in the pathogenic versus non-pathogenic category. And sometimes we do that by tracking it in family members, um, by asking specialty groups who see a lot of patients whether they've seen this variant. Um, and only in a small, small percentage is it truly an unknown answer. Um, and over time, as we test more and more family members, as we test more and more people, um, there are possibilities that variants of uncertain significance get upgraded to pathogenic or could even get downgraded. So it's kind of a, um, for some of these VUSs, it's a work in progress. So Lois Dietz syndrome is an autosomal dominant condition which means that any person that has a gene change in one of the Lois Dietz genes, each of their child has a 50-50 shot of inheriting that gene change. And it doesn't matter if it's a boy or a girl or first pregnancy or fifth pregnancy, it's that 50-50 shot. And some people and some families can track back many generations and see mother and grandmother and great grandfather and can see it track. And for some families, Lois Dietz occurs for the first time in a child or a parent. Um, and it's called a de novo or new variant. And so this just means that that Lois Dietz gene change happened when the egg and the sperm came together um, to create that individual, but that individual still has a 50-50 shot of passing it on to each child. So in terms of Lois Dietz syndrome, um, you might all be familiar with the TGF beta signaling pathway. This is the pathway where Lois Dietz gene defects um, reside. And so this um, chart, is kind of the outline pathway. And if you want also more information on it, we have a, a resource um, that Bruno can put from the Lois Dietz website that kind of talks through this pathway a little bit more. But basically we have these TGF beta ligands that kind of chemicals that float in between the cells. And if there is a variant or the, in this ligand, um, this is what causes Lois Dietz type four and five, which are defects in the TGF beta ligand two and three. And these ligands bind to the TGF beta receptors, which set on, or sit on cell surfaces. And if you have um, a defect in the receptors, that's the cause of types one and two Lois Dietz syndrome. And so once this complex occurs, then you have these um, SMAD proteins that co-localize and they get a little phosphate group added to onto them. And the SMAD groups go into the nucleus or kind of the working portion of the cell and send a whole bunch of pathways um, to work. And so defects in the SMAD proteins, at least SMAD3, causes Lois Dietz syndrome type 3. So there's variable information out there right now about SMAD2 variants. We'll show you a slide that kind of depicts the clinical features of SMAD2. Um, some physicians have called it Lois Dietz type 6. But six there's tremendous overlap. Um, it hasn't officially, through some of the genetic naming um, a source has been called Lois Dietz 6, but it's definitely in this pathway with overlap and we'll probably get there eventually. So in terms of variability, we do know that there are variable um, systemic manifestations that are suggestive of Lois Dietz syndrome. Um, things that are more specific for Lois Dietz syndrome, I would say, are craniosynostosis, the bifid uvula and cleft palate. Um, there's more club foot and cervical spine instability. And as you can see, you know, some of these connective tissue features are nonspecific for Lois Dietz syndrome. And to be fair, a lot of these connective tissue features are a bit, um, are common in the population. So we think about 15% of the population might be walking around with some hypermobility and flat feet and a little bit of scoliosis that might not be um, an aortopathy disease, but put them in the connective tissue spectrum of disease. So this is um, a, comparison, a comparison chart 
of Loewy's Dietz syndrome versus Marfan syndrome, vascular Ehlers-Danlos, and familial thoracic aortic aneurysm disease, all of which are, um, have presentations throughout the summit. Um, so in terms of kind of comparing and contrasting, in Loewy's Dietz syndrome, we see more um, arterial dissections and arterial tortuosity um, as compared to Marfan syndrome, where the, aor or the, the vascular disease is mainly in the aortic root. Um, between Loewy's Dietz syndrome and vascular EDS, um, kind of a, a difference there is that we do see arterial dissections in vascular EDS. Oftentimes in Loewy's Dietz syndrome, we see an aortic, uh, we see an aneurysm as a marker beforehand, whereas in vascular EDS, they have more dissections that happen spontaneously without aneurysms. In terms of Marfan and Loewy's Dietz syndrome, there's significant overlap between the skeletal features in terms of some individuals have the long thin body habitus, the pectus anomalies, and scoliosis. Joint laxity is a bit more common in Loewy's Dietz syndrome. Um, club foot is more um, occurs in Loewy's Dietz syndrome and the cervical spine malformations. Club foot can actually also occur in vascular EDS. I would say that the, the craniofacial features of this craniosynostosis, the wide space eyes, and the cleft palate and bipedal uvula are really distinctive markers of Loewy's Dietz compared to all the other disorders. Um, in terms of the skin features, Loewy's Dietz syndrome probably has more overlap with the vascular EDS population in terms of easy bruising, some kind of wide um, scarring, and the easily visible veins or translucent skin. Really, um, ectopia lentis or lens dislocation um, has only been described in Marfan syndrome, whereas in Loewy's Dietz syndrome, um, we see a bit more eye muscle disorders um, compared to the other disorders. And then there's some other um, rare manifestations in different organ systems that kind of help us differentiate or think about a differential diagnosis between all the syndromes. You know, so I've tried to find a really good comparison chart between all the different subtypes of Loewy's Dietz syndrome, including the one that we have that probably needs to be a little bit updated. And it's really hard because I think the features, there's so much overlap that it's really hard to say this one has more pectus, this one has more scoliosis. There's just tremendous kind of variability in the Loewy's Dietz genes in terms of systemic manifestations. So I just thought I'd put up some slides that go through um, the patients in the initial publications for Loewy's Dietz syndrome, can, so you can see how much overlap there is. So these are patients from the original TGFBR1 and 2 um, paper, and you can see the hypertelorism, you can see some contractures, um, some kind of club foot, skew foot, you can see the translucent skin and the atrophic scars and the bifid uvula. And then next to be discovered was SMAD3. And again, you can see overlapping striae, bifid uvula, um, SMAD3 was first described as having earlier onset osteoarthritis, and it's hard to say if this is really a distinguishing feature between SMAD3 and the other Loewy's Dietz syndromes, or if the investigators were really concentrating on this specific feature. Um, and then these are the patients from the original TGF beta 2 paper. So again, you see the tortuous arteries, you see the long, flat cheekbones, um, the recessed chin, the arachnodactyly. And then finally, TGF beta 3 and SMAD 2. Um, so again, the bifid uvulas, the hypertelorisms, the joint laxity, all of these are really overlapping between all the different subtypes of Loewy's Dietz syndrome. Um, so in general, we do think that there is variable expressivity, and you guys all are on um, the website and the Facebook pages, and you know there is a more severe manifestation that typically shows in kids who are diagnosed pretty early on in life perhaps with the craniosynostosis, perhaps needing surgical um, cervical spine surgery and needing aortic root repair at younger ages to a much more milder presentation where they have less prominent craniofacial features, maybe have more of the skin findings and perhaps need surgery um, later in life for their aorta. So in general, um, we typically consider people with um, Loewy's Dietz types one, two, and three to be a little bit um, more severe, again, in general, than those that present with TGF beta two and three. You know, but Dr. G um, uses this, uh, this slide and I, and I like it a lot. So, you know, if we imagine each bell curve as a different Loewy's Dietz type, 
And the top of the bell curve and kind of the middle of it is the average person presenting with that gene, um, gene change. And then the most severe is kind of to the left and the least severe is to the right. It's very easy to see that people with maybe milder presentation of TGFBR1 and 2 or low East Dietz type 1 and 2 might be less severe than those people on the, um, on the more severe, more aggressive side of the types 4 and 5. So there really is tremendous overlap. You know, some other um, places where we have, we have noticed some variability that has helped us to kind of figure out different guidelines to take care of people better are in the cardio um, thoracic surgery arena. And so again, in general, we usually think of moving forward with aortic root surgery and Lowy's Dietz types one, two, and three at smaller dimensions. We've seen people dissect um, their aortas at around 3.9 to four centimeters. So that's why we usually use that as a threshold. Whereas in types Lowy's Dietz um, four and five, we think of aortic diameters that can get a little bit bigger, maybe up to 4.5 or so. But this is really where your family history becomes very important. So were there people in your family who aortas got to five centimeters and didn't dissect? Or were there people who did dissect at 4.2 centimeters? Um, for those individuals who have large families and can get that cardiac data, that can help us kind of tailor care to you. And also just looking at your specific gene variant and seeing do we have other patients and how did they present? In terms of um, variability of allergic and GI disease, this has been observed in types 1 and 2 Lowy's Dietz syndrome. It's really an unknown right now in other types of Lowy's Dietz syndrome, but to be fair, there are fewer people that have been studied. Um, it's newer types and less people have been involved in, in those um, phenotype studies, so more to come on that. Um, another place where there's some uncertainty about outcomes and variability is pregnancy in Lowy's Dietz syndrome. I would say the first article that came out presented pregnancy as a very um, severe um, complication. And as we've seen more and more families with more and more pregnancies, um, we do see that people don't run into as much trouble. But the big problem is, is that we just don't know who's going to run into problems, is that we've seen people who have dissected within their first pregnancy, people who've made it through two or three pregnancies and been just fine. It's very variable and that's what makes it really hard so we do have these generalized guidelines in terms of pregnancies, just because we can't have that predictor as of yet of who could run into problems and who is not going to. Um, in our cohort, just um, a word on two specific variants that we've seen that present with very aggressive childhood disease. The first is in TGFBR1. It's this specific variant, T200I. Um, both of our patients with this variant um, ended up needing surgery on their aortic roots about um, before two years of age and went on to have dissections about eight or nine years of age. Um, so a very aggressive variant in TGFBR1. And there's also an aggressive variant in, in TGFBR2, which is a somewhat common variant, the R528H or CIS. Um, this is mostly a de novo variant, so we haven't seen it passed down from an adult to um, a child yet. In our cohort, where we've seen about 10 or so kids with this, 100% um, required aortic root repair in childhood, and it represents a large proportion of our individuals who have needed at least um, three vascular interventions. You know, our data is a little bit skewed because we have more females than males, but um, adolescent and female seems to be a specific time where we may we need to increase surveillance with this specific variant. And it's observations like this that are really challenging us to figure out if we need to consider different surgical considerations um, for patients with this aggressive um, variant. So there was one last question about what's new in terms of um, genetic uh, aortopathies. And I was just gonna touch briefly on one kind of syndromic new presentation. It's probably about a year and a half, two years of age. And I know that there's another um, familial aneurysm talk by Dr. Milowitz that I think they're gonna drop the link to. And I'll leave her to talk about um, the newer um, FTAD smooth muscle genes. But, um, Dr. Lowy's and his group um, and collaborators discovered a new X-linked gene. So this is a gene variant that is on the X or sex chromosome called biglycan, which presents with aortic root and ascending aortic aneurysm and dissection. 
It has some overlap with Loewy's Dietz um, syndrome in terms of wide space eyes. You can see bifid uvulas and some cervical spine abnormalities. These individuals can have variable short stature actually and signs of skeletal dysplasia on x-rays. Um, and they can actually have short fingers or long fingers, so it appears to be a little bit more variable. Currently, um, this gene, as well as SMAD2, is kind of variably on different panels, but I think probably by the end of the year, I know in Vite and some other um, companies are kind of revamping the aortopathy panels to make sure that they include biglycan and SMAD2. Um, so it's always worthwhile to check back on your panel and kind of see when it was performed and what genes are included on those panels. So that was our introduction to genetics and kind of variability in Loewy's Dietz syndrome. So thank you and we're happy um, to start looking at your questions. Or Dr. Dietz, if you have more to add, please add. <laughs> no, I, th I think you did a great job, Gretchen. That, that was a great uh, introduction and should stimulate a lot of questions, I hope. So, okay, there we go. There you go. Okay. Do you want, Gretchen, how would you um, like to handle questions and do you want me to feed them to you or do, do you have some prepared that you wanted to answer or how, how would you, the two of you like to um, go forward with that? I'll start going through them and Dr. Deeds can answer and I'll jump in if we need to. Is that cool? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Good yeah. to hear you, Dr. Deeds. <laughs> okay. Um, should relatives who show characteristics of Loewy's date syndrome, including aortic dilation, yet don't test positive for the family's identified LDS gene, continue to explore LDS as an expected cause? So um, that's actually not an uncommon situation. Um, on a regular basis, we find uh, what we truly believe to be the gene and the change that's causing a condition like Loewy's Dietz syndrome in a family, um, but recognize that there are, are um, outlier individuals in that family, typically one, sometimes more than one, who show some degree of aortic enlargement but come back negative um, for the familial gene change. That doesn't mean that that person has Loewy's Dietz syndrome, um, but does suggest that they have some other genetic predisposition for their aorta to be bigger um, than it should be. You know, if they have all the other uh, outward features of Loewy's Dietz syndrome, skeletal and uh, craniofacial features that really suggest that they have Loewy's Dietz syndrome, probably they should get in touch with the lab that did the testing to make sure there wasn't a sample mix up um, because those kinds of things, although rare, can happen. Um, but if that's not the case, um, they need to continue to be followed by a cardiologist. Um, if their aorta gets to a, a worrisome size, um, they should consider using medications and perhaps the need for surgery. You know, I can tell you that in uh, over the years that I've been doing this, um, there are probably a dozen families or so where I feel confident that there are two different gene changes causing aortic enlargement in that family. And there's at least one family where I feel very confident that there are three different genes causing aortic enlargement um, in that family. So um, uh, it's fortunately rare, but um, it does happen. Um, and I think this was a variation, a question that was a little bit later on, is that I think we get the, a similar question in terms of someone who tests negative, who has a normal aorta, um, but who has some like mild hypermobility or mild scoliosis, but they have a normal aorta. And in those cases, I don't necessarily know that it's um, necessary to be aggressive in further testing unless they have aortic dilation in a family member. Yeah, so as Gretchen mentioned, um, connective tissue findings are really pretty common in the general population. Um, if you look at families with Marfan syndrome or Loewy's Dietz syndrome, it's not at all uncommon to find occasional family members that have loose joints or a little bit of indentation of the chest wall or perhaps very mild curvature of the spine. 
What is uncommon is to find people in those families who have many of those findings in combination. So that should really be the red flag. If someone is showing up with scoliosis and pectus deformity um, and uh, severe nearsightedness at a young age and skin stretch marks, somebody needs to take a real careful look at that individual. Um, as Gretchen mentioned, if somebody just has one finding that's really common in the general population, um, you know, as long as the testing has been done that excludes that that person carries the familial gene variant, I think that they can be largely reassured. Thanks. Is there a way to find out if a family member that has already passed had the gene? We've had some family members that have had similar health issues, but were never diagnosed to have Lewy's Dietz syndrome. We always wonder if they really did. Huh. So <clears throat> it would be worth um, trying to go back in the medical records to learn as much as you can about the medical history for those family members. Um, it, there is a possibility that uh, a DNA test could be done um, to try to diagnose someone that's deceased. Um, there is the possibility of obtaining DNA from stored samples or stored tissue from someone who has passed away, for example, if an autopsy was performed. It's a bit complicated. Um, it can take quite a while to get those samples released um, from the, the facility that did the autopsy. Um, but if there is a compelling reason to try to know that answer, um, the, uh, the, the right answer to that question is yes, there are possibilities. And I think it's important to say too, like if that person who is deceased is a connector between like you who has the variant and a cousin who has the variant, you know, they can be an assumed person to have it. So if there's people on other side that have it and they're the connector in between, you really don't need to do that gene test. You know it tracked through that person. Okay. Can siblings be very different in their LDS journey? And does being male or female make a marked difference? This person has one person, a male in their family, who's had multiple heart operations, but the sister has a normal aorta um, later in life. Um, so a little bit about is there a sex difference and about differences in one family in their LDS journey? So yes, um, absolutely. You can see very dramatic variation even within a family, even among individuals that are known to have the same Lois Dietz mutation. Um, we've seen very striking examples of that where one family member has premature fusion of the skull and perhaps a, a, a cleft palate and club feet and the other family member has very few outward features, but perhaps um, does have some degree of aortic enlargement. You know, that can happen in both directions. I've seen brothers who are more severe than sisters. I've seen um, women or girls who are more severe than men or boys. Um, you know, if you play the averages, there's a suggestion that men may be somewhat more severely affected with uh, many aortic aneurysm conditions, um, but there's tremendous variation on that theme and it, it, it certainly is not predictable. Um, you know, the, the time of increased risk in some conditions like vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in boys um, is at around the time of sexual maturation when they're going through puberty. Um, the time when uh, women are at increased risk is uh, you know, around childbearing um, associated with pregnancy um, and perhaps breastfeeding. So each gender has their own challenges. Um, we do feel strongly that every member of a family who is a first degree relative of someone diagnosed with Lois Dietz syndrome um, should be carefully screened. You can't trust outward features of Lois Dietz syndrome as being an absolute predictor. 
Um, so, uh, you know, people should maintain an index of suspicion for all at-risk family members and make sure that they get the appropriate medical tests and perhaps also DNA testing. Thanks. Um, so, Sue, I think we, we talked a little bit about your questions about the new connective tissue disorders. Um, and I'm going to not pronounce this right, but Jacine, um so kind of has a family history of aneurysm and cerebral aneurysm, um, but had an aortopathy screen that was negative. So just curious, Dr. Dietz, your thoughts on like who makes a good candidate for moving forward with whole exome or what kind of family, like if people have had negative aortopathies, when should they consider more advanced testing? Okay, um, so as Gretchen mentioned, um, when you do whole exome sequencing, um, you sequence all 20,000 genes at the same time. It used to be that you'd have to sit around and think hard and come up with an idea, and then you'd go sequence that individual gene, and if the answer was no, you'd have to go back to your desk and try to come up with another good idea. You know, the good news is with whole exome sequencing, you get information on 20,000 genes all at once. The bad news with whole exome sequencing is that you get information on 20,000 genes all at once and you have to try to make sense of it. So you have to come up with some sort of strategy to try to filter through all of the, that data um, to decide what's possibly important and what's likely innocent. One way that we um, approach that is with large families. If you have someone who came back negative for an aneurysm panel, but they have seven affected relatives that you have strong confidence have the same condition as them, then you can do whole exome sequencing on all of them and ask what do they have in common? What do all seven of those people share? So that's a meaningful filter, a, a way to try to narrow things down to a, 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 a real answer. Another way is if someone is the first person in the family with a condition and they have very striking outward features. You, you, you can convince yourself that if somebody else had this condition in the family, it's unlikely they would have been missed. So there you might have the hypo hypothesis that that individual has uh, a new mutation, what Gretchen referred to as a de novo mutation, that if you do whole exome sequencing on them and both of the, their parents, you will find something new in that individual that, uh, that was not present in either parent. So that also can be a powerful filter. Um, another way you can end up with a, a child with a new condition in a family is if they have something that we call a recessive condition, that in order to show the disease, you have to in inherit an abnormal copy of a gene, of the same gene, from both parents. And there are also ways of filtering the whole exome sequencing data to see um, if that's the case, if a child with what appears to be a new condition in that family has two abnormal copies of the same gene, um, one from each parent. So I think all of those would be examples where there's a reasonable chance that you would learn something from this new type of genetic testing. Um, if someone has a very mild condition, doesn't have striking outward features, doesn't have a family history, um, you know, perhaps has uh, a, a, a late onset and mild degree of aortic enlargement. Uh, the chances of sifting through the information on 20,000 genes and coming up with an answer, are it, it, the, that chance is vanishingly small. So that might be an example of a situation where it would not yet make sense to do advanced genetic testing. Great, thanks. Um, can a parent with one type of Lowy's Dietz syndrome, perhaps type four, pass down a different type of LDS to their kids? <clears throat> 
So the way that um, the different types of Loewy's Dietz syndrome are defined um, is by virtue of what gene is involved. So let's say that a parent has Loewy's Dietz syndrome and they have a mutation in the TGFBR2 gene. So they would be classified as having Loewy's Dietz syndrome type two. The variant that they're at risk to pass to their child at a 50% risk of passing to their child is that TGFBR2 variant. If their child did, did inherit that, they also would have Loewy's Dietz syndrome type two. So in order for the child to have a different type of Loewy's Dietz syndrome, they either would have had to inherit a mutation in a different Loewy's Dietz syndrome gene from the other parent, or they'd have to have a new mutation in a Loewy's Dietz gene. And both of those situations are remarkably unlikely. Uh, it, I can't say that it could never happen, but it's really unlikely to happen. So by and large, people in the same family with Loewy's Dietz syndrome will have the same type of Loewy's Dietz syndrome. That doesn't mean it'll look exactly the same, but it would still be classified as the same type. For into, um, families that have like multiple generations of Loewy's Dietz syndrome, someone is asking a question that in the third generation, it appears um, to be a bit more um, worse than the previous generations. Does it get worse over time? So that's not known to be um, broadly true or predictable for Loewy's Dietz syndrome. There are some genetic diseases where that is known to be true with each successive generation, the condition is at high risk to get worse. Um, but that is a very unique circumstance based upon the mechanism that's causing the disease. That mechanism is not in play in Loewy's Dietz syndrome. And therefore, I don't think that that is um, uh, uh, caused by being in the next generation. I think it's just the type of variation that you can see at random. For example, it's possible that that more severely affected child could have a child with Loewy's Dietz syndrome who again shows mild features of the disease. So it, it's not getting worse in each successive generation. Um, this is a tough one. I'm trying to figure out I don't think it's answerable, but what are, what are statistical chances for a VUS within TGFBR1 gene to be later categorized as pathogenic? Um, so we know quite a bit about where mutations happen um, in the Loewy's Dietz syndrome types one and types, uh, types one and two, um, TGFBR1 and TGFBR2 genes. There, there have been pretty good rules that have been developed about where those mutations occur, what are the consequences of those mutations. There are also, um, there's also the possibility of doing tests in cells outside the body to ask, is that mutation causing a problem in how the protein works or is it not causing a problem? So, um, VUSs, variants of uncertain significance, are pretty rare in TGFBR1 and TGFBR2. Um, we can generally exclude the importance of a variant uh, based upon how common that variant is in the general population or about where that variant occurs along the gene. If it's uh, at the very beginning of the gene, it's very unlikely to be causing a problem. If it's at the end of the gene, it's much more likely to be causing a problem. You know, um, I can't answer that question precisely or about what are the percent chances, um, but you know, often a variant is categorized as of uncertain significance by the initial reporting lab. But when somebody looks at that variant who's seen lots of people with Loewy's Dietz syndrome and who's really familiar with the rules about uh, when something is likely to cause a problem or not, 
um, they often can come to a very rapid, clear decision about, uh, no, 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 that's more likely to be uh, a disease-causing change than of the U.S., or that's much more likely to be innocent um, than of the U.S. So I, I think that's the, probably the most common way that that issue is resolved, to get an opinion from somebody who's very familiar um, with looking at these types of changes. Okay. Can the mutation happen any time in life or is it from birth only? I have a son with LDS2 and a healthy older daughter. And my son is de novo, so they had parental testing, I guess. Yeah. Um, so mutations can be passed from parent to child. Um, by virtue of that change being in the cells that are making the egg cell or the sperm cell that are giving rise to that child. That's what we call an inherited mutation. Mutation can occur during the formation of the egg cell or the sperm cell that go into the conception of a child. So the parent doesn't have the change in any cell of their body. Um, but it was that one egg cell or one, one sperm cell that developed the change um, and then gave rise to a child with new Loewy's Dietz syndrome for that family. Very, 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 very rarely, um, someone with uh, a genetic condition has a change that occurred later in development, typically not after they were born, but when they were still forming in their mother's uterus, um, but um, you know, somewhere later on in the developmental process. So they may only have the mutation in their blood and their skin, or they may only have the mutation in their cardiovascular system, but not in their skeleton. Um, that's something that's called a somatic mutation. Um, it's exceedingly rare and unlikely to explain the situation that you're describing in your family. Uh, it's, if I understand your family correctly, your affected child likely has a new change that was caused by a mutation or a DNA change in the egg cell or sperm cell that went into their conception, and your other child you know, did not develop that same change. You know, a good question, a good follow-on question is, if I have a child with a new mutation that's causing a new case of Loewy's Dietz syndrome in my family, is there any risk that I'm going to have another child affected with Loewy's Dietz syndrome with the same mutation? And the answer is yes, um, because occasionally a woman has um, the mutation in a population of cells just in their ovary, or a man has the mutation just in a small population of cells in his testes. Um, so they don't have Loewy's Dietz syndrome themselves, um, but there is a higher than zero risk that they will have another child with that same mutation because another egg cell or another sperm cell would be made um, that has that change. Um, that's something that's called germline mosaicism. It has been described for Loewy's Dietz syndrome, but also rather uncommon. Yeah. Um, what type, this is kind of a, a clinical question, but we'll take a detour. Um, is there any specific type of eye muscle disorder present in LDS, specifically type five? Um, so I do not know of eye problems that are unique to any specific type of Loewy's Dietz syndrome. Um, I do know that in various types of Loewy's Dietz syndrome, um, you can have weakness of eye muscles that cause a condition called strabismus, where the, uh, an eye will look inward or look outward, will have a hard time um, looking straight forward. Um, that is actually a, quite a common finding in Loewy's Dietz syndrome types one and two, 
Um, but we have observed that, and I've uh, talked with ophthalmologists who have observed that problem in other types of Loewy's Dietz syndrome. Other issues that we think about in people with Loewy's Dietz syndrome related to the eye would include um, a, a fortunately rare circumstance called retinal detachment, um, where the nerve layer in the back of the eye um, peels away um, and can lead to a, a serious loss of vision if not treated urgently. Um, again, uh, not particularly common, but certainly described in people with Loewy's Dietz syndrome. As Gretchen mentioned, people with Loewy's Dietz syndrome do not have the strong predisposition for eye lens dislocation that's present in Marfan syndrome. Um, they can have nearsightedness, but it doesn't it's not as frequent and does not tend to be as severe um, as what's seen um, in Marfan syndrome. So long answer to a short question, um, you know, I, I do not know of any eye problems specific um, to Loewy's Dietz syndrome type 5. Okay. So I have a feeling this next question, I know who answered or asked this question, I think it's one of our patients, but there's probably people um, in this case as well. So say that there is someone who has um, an aortic root or ascending aneurysm, there's no known family history, their genetic testing has thus far been normal, but we've kind of given them a clinical diagnosis of Loewy's Dietz syndrome because we feel like they fit in that spectrum. How do we as clinicians make decisions about aortic surgery in those cases? So that's a really excellent question. Um, so whenever we're making a clinical decision about whether to move forward with some form of treatment, including a surgery, we're always trying to weigh the risks of doing the procedure versus the risk of not doing this procedure. So you're, you're, you're assessing at every moment in time the risk that would be imposed by moving forward, but also the possible benefit to that individual of moving forward um, at that moment in time. Now, if somebody definitely has Loewy's Dietz syndrome types one and two, and particularly if they have mutations that, uh, a mutation that we've previously seen in people with early onset and severe vascular complications, you know, we feel very confident in saying you should go ahead at four centimeters and sometimes even smaller than four centimeters. If someone has um, LDS, type four or five, and they have six family members that also have LDS of the same type, and all of those family members are in middle to late age and either have not required surgery or only needed surgery very late in the game and never, never had an aortic dissection, now we feel comfortable saying you can wait to at least four and a half centimeters before that risk benefit ratio would favor moving forward. So, you know, what we're going to be doing in the circumstance where you're describing, where we don't have a precise answer regarding diagnosis, is we're going to do a deep dive into family history, try to learn everything about every relative that we can. We're going to monitor the rate of aortic growth really carefully and look for some warning signs, like a sudden change in the rate of growth of the aorta. That's something that we pay attention to. Something changed. The tissue quality has changed. You know, we need to adapt. We're going to take, keep a careful look on the performance of the aortic valve as the aorta gets large. It can stretch the aortic valve and cause it to leak. And we, you know, our goal now for most patients is to do something called a valve sparing procedure that would allow them to avoid the need for lifelong anticoagulants. Um, so we know that we have to intervene before there's severe valve damage and severe valve dysfunction. So, you know, the same principles would apply for the circumstance that you're describing. Even if we don't have a diagnosis, we're going to use every other bit of information that we can collect to try to make the best decision for that individual. 
So someone is asking your thoughts again on the variability within one type of Loewy's Dietz like er, syndrome. If you think it's more likely to be caused by the kind of gene variant, other genetic factors, other external factors, like what are your thoughts on the variability um, and the causes of variability? Yeah. So as we've discussed, the, the gene that's involved contributes to variability. Um, as we've discussed, the, the precise mutation that's present um, influences disease severity and therefore variability between families. But as we've also discussed, there can be dramatic variation among individuals in the same family with the same underlying Loewy's Dietz syndrome mutation. So therefore, there, in that circumstance, we can't blame it on the gene. Uh, the variation. We can't blame it on the mutation. All those people have the same mutation. So we have to start thinking about other variables, other factors. And when we think about those other so-called modifier factors, there are two broad classes. One of them is the environment. You know, what has been the experience of that person over time? Did they do a lot of weightlifting early in life and also get into a couple of car accidents and um, have high blood pressure that was un poorly controlled, whereas their more mildly affected relatives always took meticulous good care of themselves and um, you know, didn't uh, partake in any of those risky behaviors? Uh, we think about medication use. Uh, did one person start medication at a young age to try to modify the rate of aortic growth and another person either never took medication or wasn't very compliant with taking their medication when they were supposed to? So there's a whole big list of potential environmental modifiers that we think about. But now there's another category of a lot of interest to many researchers, and that's something that we call genetic modification. So we talked about we all have 20,000 genes. Uh, we talked about we, that we all have variation in all those genes, and most of that variation is innocent. It dictates what we look like, what our hair color is, what our eye color is. Sometimes that background normal variation can either make a disease worse, something that we call protected, and I'm sorry, uh, aggravating modification, or can make an underlying genetic disease better, something that we call protective modification. You know, um, those, as those normal variants pass throughout a family, it's like dealing a hand of cards. Uh, you know, is this person with Marfan syndrome, for example, or Loewy's Dietz syndrome going to get a good hand of those normal variants from their relatives just by chance? Or are they gonna get a bad hand? Or are they gonna get dealt the variants in those other genes that make things worse or, or simply fail to protect? So there's a lot of research now to try to understand those modifiers, to understand especially how the protective genes and variants work. Because if we could understand how nature has learned to protect some people with Loewy's Dietz syndrome, perhaps we can use a medication to try to mimic that protective effect, to try to duplicate it in someone that did not get dealt the favorable hand of variants. So um, I think that it's a combination of what genes involved, what variants involved, um, but also what our life's experiences are and um, the protective variation that we inherited from, from our parents. Thank you. So last question, because we're running up on time, and this is actually a question I've been struggling with as well, knowing that testing panels are changing. Um, your thoughts on if someone has had a negative panel, but now that SMAD2 is being offered, like should we be offering just that as a single gene? Like what are your thoughts on pursuing that now that, because it hasn't been on panels? And can you talk a little bit about about Loewy's Dietz type six potentially? Yeah, um, so people um, 
should take a careful look at you and say, you know what, there is this new gene available on a panel. Does that gene make any sense for you as an individual? You know, does it match with your features? Is it plausible that your condition would be caused by a change in that gene? If the answer is yes, um, then it may make sense to do that testing. And um, to be honest, I would choose the method that's most reliable and least expensive. Um, you know, if you can get, if it's only that one new gene that's available on the panel, um, and it costs less to get that one gene sequence than to repeat the whole panel, I would choose to just get that one gene sequence. If, however, since the last time that you were tested, there are five new genes on the panel and three of them could make sense for you, it probably would make sense to get the panel repeated rather than to have each of those three other individual genes done. So Lewis Dietz syndrome type six or uh, whatever someone is referring uh, to it as caused by mutations in SMAD2 um, ha can have skeletal and craniofacial features um, that overlap with Lois Dietz syndrome. Um, it can have aortic aneurysm, although there are people, uh, there are quite a few people that uh, have inherited the familial SMAD2 mutation that for reasons we don't understand are not showing aneurysms early or even late in life. Um, it, it, it's not uncommon to see people with a SMAD2 mutation that never got the aneurysm that was seen in their brother or sister or aunt or uncle that led to the initial testing. Um, what also is not seen in people with SMAD2 mutations to the same extent as TGFBR1 or 2 or SMAD3 mutations is aneurysms elsewhere throughout the circulation. Um, or aneurysms that are tearing at small dimensions. You know, so that's, you know, that's what's making people, uh, you know, giving them incentive to collect more information uh, before deciding what proper management principles are, for example, in people with, um, with SMAD2 mutations. Um, Certainly, um, in some of the cases, when you see the, uh, an individual uh, with a SMAD2 mutation, there's little doubt in your mind that it's in the Lois Dietz syndrome spectrum of disease. If you just look at their face and look at their skeleton and even look at their aortic root. Um, but then there are these other factors that suggest that this is at a new mild end of the spectrum, milder than what we've seen before in other forms of Lois Dietz syndrome. You know, we have to consider that the clinical spectrum of severity in aortic aneurysm conditions is very broad in all the conditions we think about. You know, we see young children with Marfan syndrome who at birth have really striking skeletal um, and facial features, have very severe and rapidly progressive aortic enlargement and valve dysfunction within the first few months of life, who may require surgery within the first um, two or three months of life to try to um, save their lives. Um, and then there are other people with Marfan syndrome. No one would argue that they don't have Marfan syndrome who um, you would not pick out of the crowd at age 75, um, who perhaps have some very mild scoliosis and some nearsightedness and an aortic root at age 75 of 4.0 centimeters. Um, so, you know, the, the issue of wide variation in clinical severity is not new to us. And, you know, I think that there are good practices and rules in place to make sure 
at every possibility that you're not making recommendations based upon the average person with that condition, but rather are making recommendations based on everything that you can learn from that person sitting in front of you. So that's what you should be challenging your doctors to do. So with that, um, I think we're gonna wrap up for this evening. Um, but many, many thanks to our presenters, Dr. Dietz, Gretchen, you, you two are just a powerhouse of information. We're so grateful for the time and expertise you've shared with us here tonight. Um, you're part of what makes this such a fantastic and unprecedented event and we're, we're really grateful for, for both of you. Um, I know there were a lot of questions and I'm sure we did not get to all of them. Apologies that we don't have enough time to cover everything. Uh, but if your question was not answered and you would like to get some information, our marfan.org slash e3ask, um, the form there will be directed to our on-staff nurse and chief science officer who are, who are helping to source um, answers for everyone just as quickly as we can um, with the volume that we are receiving right now through this event. Uh, it, does, it is taking a little bit of time, but you will get a response. Um, as we're wrapping up, please be sure to rate this session and uh, it takes less than a minute and it's really important information for us in future programs. Also, if you are um, in the app or on the website, you can visit the exhibitor section of this event, which is, you know, sort of different given that it's a virtual exhibit hall, but there is some great information in there and some good resources that might be helpful in your day-to-day um, -day doings as either a caregiver or a person who lives with Lois Dietz syndrome or any connective tissue condition. If you are not yet participating in the community part of the app or on the website, please join in. There is so much good discussion going on, both related to living with a connective tissue condition and also just connecting with people who get it, right? Who understand just living life with one of these conditions. And some of it's just fun and lighthearted and some of it's very, um, very useful uh, daily living type information. If you are a social media person and are posting about this event uh, online, we would love for you to share, share with our E3, hashtag E3 Summit 20, um, tag that way we can see what everybody's up to and help share in that experience with you as well and if you are having a great experience with this and feel moved to do so and are able we would very much appreciate any donation that you would like to contribute um, that is what makes it possible for us to continue to operate uh, programs like this one and you can do that through marfan.org donate Again, we are so grateful to Gretchen and Dr. Dietz. Um, do either of you have any parting thoughts you would like to share? Everybody stay happy, stay healthy, stay safe. Ditto, that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you everyone. Um, the recording of this will be available at uh, the link where the session, uh, where you came in to view the session, hopefully by um, tomorrow. So step back if you want to listen again, uh, be sure to check the chat. We did drop a few resources in there, uh, submit your questions and otherwise, thank you both so much and we'll see you all at another session very soon. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Thanks.